On this episode of Narcissist Apocalypse, we talk with an abuse survivor named Nico. And Nico was one of 30 plus women who were in a toxic relationship with a serial predator. It's a story of Facebook phishing, future faking, financial abuse, and solidarity. Welcome to Narcissist Apocalypse, everyone. And this is a podcast that gives a voice to survivors of toxic relationships. I am Brandon Chadwick, but my friends call me Chad. And thanks for tuning into this episode. So what is a narcissist, you may ask? Well, for the purposes of this podcast, we refer to a narcissist as anyone who has displayed a pattern of behavior that shows a limited capacity to appreciate others' perspective. It is that simple. Now, if you have not been to our website recently, please do go to NarcissistApocalypse.com if you want to be a guest on our show and share your story. Top of the page, you should be able to find a button that says Guest Form. You click on that button, fill out the form, and away we will go. Another way to be on our show is to be part of our Letters to Our Narcissist compilation episode. And you can go to NarcissistApocalypse.com for that. And on the side of the page, there's a floating button that says Send Voicemail. Click on that button, button, it records up to five minutes. You press it twice, it records up to 10. We are accumulating these letters for our Letters to My Narcissist compilation episode number six. And if you do not want to read the letter yourself, you can send us an email at NarcissistApocalypse at gmail.com and put letters to my narcissist in the subject line and me or my old pal Melissa will read the letter for you. And let's see what we have here. We have a Patreon, everyone. Yes, we have a Patreon. If you want to support our show, come to our Patreon. We have episodes that never made it to air. Follow up with I'll follow up episodes with former guests and much, much more. What is that much more? Well, we have online virtual support groups now every Wednesday and Saturday. Those are rocking and rolling. We also have our own Facebook type discussion group where we can just chit chat with each other. Uh, You know, we support each other, you know, have memes, everything uh, under the sun can be on our little discussion forum group. It's private. It's not on Facebook. It's secure. So that's at patreon.com slash narcissist apocalypse. You want to support the show, keep us free, keep us going, Uh, sign up to our Patreon, become a Patreon patron today. And uh, let's see, we're trying to get this, uh, make this short this week. So this is a really interesting episode. And, you know, Nico is a master storyteller, in my opinion. She does a fantastic job. This is an episode, I think, that people will talk about for a while. And, you know, this is a three-part story in a way. And the last part of the story is, you know, Nico wants to bring this person to justice. So uh, it's a really... uh, interesting episode and kind of different from what we've been doing recently because, you know, we don't really have someone who goes after and holds someone accountable uh, at the end. And this is what happened. And it's, you know, this, this story spans multiple countries and uh, a lot of different women were affected by it. So I want to thank uh, Nico. And also at the beginning, we had a little bit of a sound problem in the first like few minutes, but we fixed it. So just bear with it for the first few minutes and that's it. So thank you for listening. And I hope you enjoy this podcast with Nico. Welcome to Narcissist Apocalypse, everyone. With me today, I have Nico. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. Well, we spoke at least a month ago, I think. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And now we're here and your story is kind of divided up into three different stories where we're going to discuss your upbringing, we're going to discuss your relationship, and then we're going to discuss something that we described as the hunt or the chase where, you know, this story goes into uh, another realm of, of trying to get someone to be accountable for their actions. 
and you know your story spans multiple countries. <laughs> yes. Deception not just against you, but to yeah. uh, many uh, women out there. And your story is being told by you. And I say that because sometimes you have different types of storytellers uh, on the show. And when I spoke to you originally, I said, you remind me of the, the man from the documentary Man on Wire and the way you're able to just tell a story in such with enthusiasm. So I was excited to have you on the show uh, again and to do this recording. And this is also one of those episodes where if you're not involved in, you know, the narcissistic abuse kind of community, domestic abuse or whatever, you know, there's an entertainment factor as far as the, the chase aspect of everything that is, uh, you know, might have provide some sort of value to those who don't listen to the show ever. And also uh, with the story, just a, a warning for everyone, there's a lot of characters in, the, <laughs> in, in part three of the story. So we have uh, tried to spruce up the names so you can remember them. And we're also going to have in the show description, the names and a little bit of description of those people. So you can kind of keep on track and uh, you might laugh at some of the names. We tried to use famous people's names as much as we could to um, make it easier to remember in a way. And hopefully it mm -hmm. works and hopefully uh, no one gets too confused. And now I've spoken way too much. And so uh, Nico, Thank you for, for taking your time and being here uh, today. And the floor is now yours. Thank you so much. And thank you for having me. Um, yeah. You see, the country where I live, narcissism is not um, really being talked about. And it's only uh, in retrospect now that I understand that out of the four caretakers in my childhood, three had a strong narcissistic disposition, let's say. Um, my mother was uh, extremely beautiful. She worked as a model. And she was a full-blown somatic narcissist, plus she was an alcoholic. Um, my father was very career-oriented. And they met when they were um, in high school. Um, my father, my, my mother got pregnant three times and my father made her take an abortion. And that was, given the fact that I'm already 55 years old, um, you can imagine back in the days, each and every time she risked her life. So when she was pregnant with me, she said, no, I'm going to have that baby. I don't care what you say. And because he was a Catholic, he, he then decided they should get married. And even today, when I look at the photographs, they give me chills because there is no joy. There is no love. There is no happiness. You look at them and you actually feel like these two people don't even like each other. <laughs> and... Um, even on the day they were getting married, my grandmother, my mother's mother said to her, look, you don't have to marry this man. We can get along just fine without him, which was a big thing to say back in the days. I, I can, in retrospect, I can see how basically my, the narcissistic abuse, I spent most of the time alone with my mother because my father was away in another city making a career for himself. And he didn't want my mother around, basically, because she was very impulsive and was most likely going to ruin things for him. So I grew up basically alone with my mother and her mother, who was a very kind person. And my father was away making a career for himself in another city. And uh, my mother was very, very unhappy because she had pictured her marriage completely different with this man who was going to make a career and she was going to be the woman, you know, on his side. And she, she was drinking quite heavily. And what happened is, I want to give you an example of how she actually stole my reality and why later on it became so difficult for me to hold on to my reality, to what I was experiencing and really, yeah, hold on to that. So we had a two-room apartment. My mother was sitting in the other room and I heard her sobbing and crying. And I was about maybe 10 years old or 12 years old. And I said to myself, oh, my God, she's crying. You know, let me go over and console her. So that's what I did. And my mother looked at me with tears running down her cheeks. And she said, I am tall, strong, um, slim and beautiful. 
remember the somatic narcissist. Um, and I am not crying. So the child says, okay, I thought she was crying. I heard her crying. I saw her crying, but she's telling me it's not true. So I made a mistake. I went back into my room. Two days later, same situation. I hear her crying. I hear her sobbing. I want, I want to get up and say, okay, let me console her. And then I say to myself, okay, I tried this two days ago, but actually she told me it was wrong. I saw her crying, but she told me she wasn't crying. So what I did was wrong. So I just stayed in my room. And not five minutes later, my mother comes flying through the door. She says, you're the most ungrateful child I can imagine. Your mother is sitting in the room next to yours and she's crying. You're not even coming over, making an attempt to console her. How can you do this? So it came to a point where... If you disputed what I said, like you, you would say, oh, the red dress you wore yesterday was so beautiful. But I knew I, I don't have a red dress. I was wearing a green dress. And I would say, but my dress was green. And you just kept insisting. No, no, I loved it. It was beautiful. I loved the red. I, I would just give in and say, okay, the red dress was great. Thank you. <laughs> I, I couldn't hold on to what, I, to what my senses were telling me. And I found that this played a very big role later on in, uh, in suffering narcissistic abuse. I was really primed for this kind of abuse. Um, I moved out from home when I was 16. I moved in um, with my first boyfriend. Um, after that, I had lots of abusive relationships, but I had no clue what it was. I just saw things going wrong, but I couldn't explain why this was happening to me. I, could, I didn't understand it. Uh, when I was uh, in my late 20s, I met my future ex-husband, who's a very decent and wonderful person. We got married. We, ha we have a beautiful son. But somehow things went wrong. I would say probably... The birth of my son triggered my complex PTSD reaction very much. And I started to take control of almost everything. I didn't give him enough space, but I couldn't see that at the time at all because I wasn't aware what is complex PTSD. Again, this is nothing that anyone talks about in this country. Um, my son is now, or our son is now 23 and he's a wonderful person. And we, my ex and I, we separated about 10 years ago. Again, I had abusive relationships. Again, I didn't understand what was going on. And I had just come out of one of those relationships, two years of that kind of relationship. Um, and I was very, very sad at the time. And I had picked up on a new hobby. I started uh, street photography and I became quite obsessive with it. So basically, I would spend my days going to work, walking the streets, taking pictures, going home, editing my photos. And then at some point, I started posting them. And mind you, I, I had never seen myself as a visual person before. I always made music, but I had never painted or anything. Um, the, when I started posting my photographs, all of a sudden, I got very enthusiastic reactions and um, some of the street photography groups like I would post in 20 groups and eight or ten of them would have my one of my photos as a cover photo it, I was really astonished and all of a sudden I started to have all these Facebook friends <laughs> um, from all over the world and of course there were a lot of young men contacting me and it was quite clear that they were not so very much interested in me as a photographer but rather in me as a European woman to get in touch with for ulterior motives and that was okay but I always felt that was easy to, to see. Um, I was told him well thank you but I'm not interested in this and that and I also made a lot of really wonderful photographer friends and my timeline was full of, with comments from a mix of these people, my photographer friends, as well as people I'd never met before. And yeah, of, of dubious motives, I would say. Um, and here comes someone whose profile at the time was called dopamine. 
which was a, a wordplay with his name. And I thought it was actually quite clever. And he starts uh, commenting on my stuff. And also at the time, I didn't have that many friends that I didn't see everybody's posts. The algorithms were still different. So I saw some of his posts and I always felt they were quite witty. You know, they always stood out. The way he described things was funny. And, and so, so I started commenting on his stuff. And at some point he says, well, can I chat with you? And I said, well, try me in the evening, you know, when I would usually sit and edit my photos. And um, sure enough, he contacted me and he came out with this question that always made me roll my eyes. Tell me about yourself. Uh, and I was like, OK, I'm going to cut this short. You know, I have no time for this. I'm editing my photos. I don't really want to chat to someone who asked me a stupid question like that. So I said, um, well, I'm a survivor of life and I believe in change because I believe there's a core in all of us that never changes. And I felt that was like <laughs> esoteric enough to cut the conversation short. But all of a sudden he comes back saying, wow, I've never, I've never had an answer like this. I'm so happy I contacted you. I don't like small talk, you know, let's talk about these ideas. And, and I was like, oh, okay. And really he came up with, some interesting stuff. You know, I always say, talk to me for real or don't talk to me at all. I'm really not a small talk person. And it seemed quite real what he was saying, but also it was becoming flirty rather quickly. Now, this guy is a lot younger than me. And I was like, well, we can talk, but that's it. Um, and he was like, oh, but you're great. Uh, uh, <clears throat> So I, I was trying to keep it on wraps. Uh, and in retrospect, I have to say, I was going through this phase where I was obviously craving attention, but not allowing myself to get it. And why am I putting it like this? Because I do have a lot of friends and a lot of people care for me and I know it. But because of my CPTSD, I have never really been able to just fully open up to them and just be natural. For example, people invite me to their birthday parties a lot. It's only now that I understand because I've been educating myself about the consequences of narcissistic abuse that it is a very typical thing, actually, that victims of narcissistic abuse, when they are abused in childhood, have difficulties with all sorts of um, occasions as birthdays or Christmas or, and all my life I was wondering, why is this so hard for me? Because people would invite me and I just, I would always say, yeah, I'm coming. Yeah. And I'd be happy to be invited. But when the day comes, I can't go. Um, anyway. Um, <laughs> I, well, I just want to point out here as far as, uh, you and uh, the narcissist in the story. So at this point of, of, of your life, uh, would you say that, uh, you know, you've gone relationship to relationship and then also with your childhood that maybe your self-esteem might not be the best at this point? Is that fair to say or no? Well, the funny thing is that most people perceive me as a person with very high self-esteem. And I'm not sure what I would say about the way my self-esteem actually is, but yeah, maybe it's, maybe it's an issue, but um, I think it's mostly about understanding the, the complex PTSD, how that works on you. Um, I'm sorry for the break. Um, I have uh, to think. That's okay. <laughs> Well, the, really, the, the point that I was trying to get to, um, so when it comes to him and the manner mm -hmm. in which you met and his tactics, you know, to point mm -hmm. out here to everyone, you know, because you never know what you're looking for. You know, you are used to the people that are coming to you and bothering you. And here's a guy that is, we'll really discuss more later about it, uh, who is sitting on Facebook all the time, who is not trolling um, for people. He's waiting for people 
to look at his things and then contact him. And in a weird way, when that happens, people are unsuspecting of what he's actually doing because he's not the initiator of the conversation. So in a weird way, he's kind of setting up his profile, setting up all of these things, and it's a reverse trap because if you're the one contacting him, you're not going to start thinking, oh, I'm falling into a trap. But he's already set the trap in a way, and he's looking for a specific type of person. And, you know, he's just looking for that conversation to begin, and that's kind of where it's going. And if you never contacted him, you would never have met him. He would never would have been the person who's doing the, the fishing on the other way. He's waiting for someone else to fish, throw that fish line in, thinking they're about to catch a bass or a trout. But really, there's a shark on the other end, and that shark's about to pull you into the water out of your boat. And the shark's got a plan. The shark, the shark has a plan, yeah. He moves in with a plan. Yeah, I think what how he got through to me is I was really, I had been isolating way too much. And when, and this is also my advice, you know, keep a solid safety net of friends around, uh, of non-toxic people, people you can really trust. And that I hadn't been doing enough. And he came in and I felt understood because he was giving me the story how he is this guy um, who is different from the rest. He's a much deeper thinker and um, he just cannot identify with everybody else. They all have this herd mentality, um, societies, um, you know, coming down on him, but he really wants to be original and he's much more individualistic. And, and that's how I felt understood because I felt isolated. I felt like I couldn't connect. And here comes this person who's saying, I feel lonely. I cannot connect because people, I feel most people are superficial. They cannot understand where I come from and so on. And all of a sudden we seem to connect. So this is how I got in. You know, I, I was too isolated. This is how he, how he pulled me in, I would say. And then uh, all, we started, you know, all of a sudden he calls me every day and he sends me songs and he's doing these super cheesy romantic things but I totally fall for it because I'm so I'm number one I am a super romantic person and number two um I love adventure and I love fairy tales <laughs> and he would say like have you ever listened to music in the rain which is a stupid question to start with and I was like yeah of course I guess I, there will have been a day where I was listening to music and it was raining. No, no, no. I sent you um, a, an audio of, of uh, a thunderstorm and you send me a song and we count down and on one we will both listen to the song in the rain. You know, it sounds cheesy, but when you're all isolated and we go like, oh, that's a lovely idea. <laughs> okay, so... Um, it, it, it all feels a little bit weird to me, but on the other hand, I'm enjoying the attention. And also, it's I didn't know what love bombing was. So for him to just keep texting me and sending me messages and we would talk every night for hours, I was like, well, who, you know, who else should there be in his life if he's spending every evening with me? Um, and then all of a sudden, as I felt already quite in love somehow, um, he disappears. A few weeks in, he just disappears. And um, I'm like, did I dream all of this? Did, how is this even possible? That What was that? And then a few weeks later, he comes back on. I'm in the middle of a big event that I'm organizing. And he's like, ah, here I am again. <laughs> And I was super angry. I said, what the hell are you thinking? And he's like, oh, you see, I'm this guitar student and I had exams and I couldn't tell you in advance. And I'm thinking like, that doesn't make sense. You always have time to tell somebody if you have to disappear for a while, you know, go offline or whatever. 
but again, I, I think I just felt so drawn in. You know, I had been missing the attention. I've been missing our evenings, what I thought were conversations. He seemed quite intelligent at the time. I didn't know the backstory of what he was telling me. But um, yeah, so I got pulled back in. And then after a while, because everything he wrote was either in English or in French. And he had all these French women on his timeline which did make me suspicious because they seemed to comment in a way that I felt was not really appropriate, but he would just play it off and say, ah, you don't know the French mentality. This is how we are, we Frenchies. So basically I assumed he was living in France. And at some point I suggested, hey, we could meet up sometime. Also because there was a lot of future faking. You and me in the south of, uh, of France is going to be so romantic and blah, blah, blah. So I said, well, you know, how about actually getting together a time? And here he goes, oh, I forgot to mention, I live in Algeria, <laughs> which is not exactly a neighboring country to where I live, but um, a country in northern Africa. Um, between Morocco and Tunisia. So uh, together they formed the Maghreb. How long would a flight be from where you live to, uh, uh, what, what, sorry, Algeria, to Algeria? Where he lives? Yeah. yeah. Well, about two to three hours. Okay, okay. It's, it's doable, but on the other hand, Algeria is quite a closed country. You need an invite to enter Algeria. Like probably you can book a flight to some hotel and, and stay at the resort. But if you actually want to visit a private, you have to have an invite. It's not, and you have to get a visa, which usually I don't because of my passport. I can travel rather freely. But for Algeria, I would need to apply for a visa and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. It's not an easy thing to do. And also there is almost no information about the current situation in Algeria where I live. So all the things that he was telling me about, how the secret police has him on the radar because he has all these friends abroad and you can't have that in Algeria. I, how would I know? You know, you can go online, but if you don't speak French, in, in France, because the, France was the colonial um, occupying p f uh, power in Algeria for a long time. Um, there is a, a, There are lots of connections between Algeria and France. And if you speak French, you can find out quite a bit. If you don't, it is extremely difficult to find out what the current situation. For example, he would tell me, I couldn't call you because Algeria, the internet is so bad. I just can't have a connection. If you go online, check Wikipedia. It says Algeria has the worst internet connection in the world. Okay. That's all the information I can get, right? <laughs> So, yeah. so before we, we continue, just for everyone who's listening, who might make judgments or anything along those lines, you're in another country. This person is now in Algeria. Your connection with him on, you know, uh, on the on a love or a spiritual level, on an intellectual level, is uh, pretty high. So, like, you're running on this other kind of. Uh, fuel at this moment as far as is this a good idea is this not a good idea you know you met this guy you've been isolated you finally have this connection and all of these things that interest you after all this time and you know eventually you will find out you're, you're, you you want to kind of take the chance you you want you you kind of have to meet this person at you've been talking for so long at a certain point so uh, sorry for interrupting just continue from mm -hmm. there yeah, it's it's true. Um, there was a lot of mirroring going on. And that's why I, I, I felt closer and closer and closer to this guy. But after about nine months or so, I had a mental breakdown. I didn't connect the dots that it was, of course, because of all the crazy making. That's part of narcissistic abuse is crazy making. Somebody hijacks your reality and runs with it. And you're basically left with panic attacks and you, you can't really live your life properly. So I had a mental breakdown at work. Um, and I was really doing ex not well at all. And I was going through a phase where actually my father was paying attention to how I was doing. And he realized that I was not well. And he said, well, um, do you, 
I think it would be good for you if you could go on a vacation. Where do you want to go? So because I love street photography, I decided to go to Cuba because it's like a street photographer's paradise. And while I was in Cuba, I felt that I was getting better. And also I felt this relationship, whatever this is, this online thing is not good for me. I need to end this. At the same time, I didn't feel strong enough to just say, well, listen, I'm not going to call you anymore and I don't want you to call me again. So what happened was um, I, I had an affair with, uh, in Cuba and it was wonderful, you know. And I said to myself, I'm going to have this affair and I'm going to tell this guy, this online narc guy, um, that I had an affair and most certainly that will turn him off and he will go away and he will never show up again. And um, when I came back, that's exactly what I did. I told him everything that had happened. And sure enough, he blocked me, he didn't call me again, and I was actually quite happy for a while. I said, okay, I've got that out of the way. I think it's better for me because it didn't have a future. Okay. But I couldn't hold that up. Um, after like five or six weeks or so, I started missing our conversations. I started missing this steady point of connection. And um, I produced a special photography series and um, put it into an exhibition and dedicated it to this narc. And um, I sent him the invite. It had the dedication on it. And he said, well, thank you very much and good luck with that, <laughs> which was okay, <laughs> which was perfectly fine. I said, okay, that." is over, is over, is over. But also when we first spent so much time together um, on the on the internet, um, when we first met, we also made music together. And he told me he was studying guitar and I've always made music and I used to write songs. And I came up with this song, which was uh, has the rather clairvoyant title, Masterpiece of Craziness. And <laughs> it's about this relationship. And I was wondering, you see, if somebody writes a song for you and you play the guitar, if, if I was that person, I would try to play it. But he never tried to play it. Once I understood the person that he was, I understood that, number one, it must have driven him crazy for me to be able to write a song without any effort when he never manages to write a song, <laughs> although he's portraying himself as this great guitar guitarist. <clears throat> And also, um, he, he probably wasn't able to perform it because he, he is actually not a great guitarist. He's just saying that he is. Oh, we'll get and, there. We'll get there. <laughs> and, and the song is actually quite hard to play from what I hear from other people. So, um, but I, I always told him, I'm going to perform this song because I've always been into singing. And then I actually managed to perform the song. I got someone to help me um, transcribe the music and he played the piano and we performed the song on stage and it was quite successful. And I sent him the video. And then I got a response that was a little bit different. It was more like, oh, that is so sweet of you. And, and I was thinking, ah, maybe there is a chance, you know. And that was about a year and a half after we met initially. And then just before Christmas, <clears throat> he calls me and he's, he's given me another cheesy story. Oh, you see, I've never been able to forget you all this time. It hurt me so much when you told me about this affair, but um, I, I, I could never forget you. And I've, I went in, now get this, I went into the desert to find myself and to understand what this is about you and me. And I think I have found myself and I know I cannot forget you and we have to continue this relation, blah, blah, blah. But I fell for it again and I said, well, it's great great that um, we're back in touch, but we do need to meet. I cannot leave this as an online thing all this time. It's driving me crazy. We have to meet up. So we fix a time early February to meet in Tunisia. Uh, I rented a very, very romantic and sweet Airbnb. And just so everyone knows, Tunisia is the closest of the African countries 
uh, near you where you will have less of a problem to travel to? Yeah. So we met in Tunisia. This was, it was a really cozy Airbnb right by the beach. The man who rented it out had been a cameraman and from all his trips, he brought stuff and it's all in this beautiful Airbnb. It's really quite amazing. And I get there before the narc and I check the place out. And um, then we were supposed to meet for the first time. And he tells me where to meet him. And I sit at this tea place and I drink tea and I wait for him to call and I I move I, I move he calls me he says I'm going to be there in 10 minutes and I get out of the out of the place and I I see him because he's carrying his guitar but he doesn't see me right away and for a second he panics <laughs> oh my god is she really here and um then we meet up and he's like oh you're amazing oh my god we finally met ba 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 and with all the future faking and everything, it wasn't quite the first meeting that I had anticipated. It was this romantic adventure, but when we actually met, it was like, yeah, but I was on a long trip. You see, I'm really tired. And I was like, what? <laughs> that was quite surprising. But anyway, we only spent a few days, three or four days or so. He showed me around and he, he was quite a gentleman. And I really enjoyed those four days. The I think the second day, because it was February, it was very rainy, and we hardly got a got um, a chance to spend time outside. But the second day, we were sitting in this beach bar, and I said to him, "Look, I don't know you. I don't know what you're really about. But I tell you one thing: just don't fuck with me, because if you do, you're going to be in trouble." And I don't really remember his answer, but he was like, oh, no. Oh, mm -mm. And I said to him, you see, I have been in relationships that were sort of abusive before. Uh, like people tried to isolate me from my friends. That I would never let that happen. That will never, ever happen to me. You see, even though I cannot fully open up to my friends all the time, I hold them very, very dear. I mean, they mean so much to me. And I told him, look, that's not going to happen. And immediately he was mirroring me. Oh, I had a girlfriend like that. It was horrible. <laughs> she did the same thing. No, I would never do that to you. Okay. Um, I left uh, four days later. I went back home. And he told me from there he had to travel with his academy orchestra. Uh, and he wouldn't be available for the next week and a half or so. Actually, I left in the morning and in the afternoon, another woman came in. But I found that out much later. <laughs> so we were planning for another meeting like half a year later. Um, because he said, no, I can't, you know, I have my schedule. I have to study for the university and da, 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 da. Okay. So we're planning to get together again in August. Uh, in between, he keeps harping on about how his financial situation is so bad. He, he is a student, but he also needs to make some money. He's staying at his, uh, well, his father has two houses and one is for the siblings. And that's where he's staying with his brothers and sisters. And uh, he's making some money on the side, cleaning marble floors with a special machine. But he's getting very, very little money out of what is actually being paid for the job. And then one day the guy tells him, look, I found someone who wants even less money for this and you're out. And he's, it's a big story. Oh, my God, what am I going to do? And at some point I'm saying, well, it would be great. Maybe if you had that machine yourself, you could buy that machine and set up your own business doing that. Yeah, I know exactly how to do this because I've been doing it for a long time. I know the people who want the service. I could do this. And it's, he's painting this big future faking picture of, of himself as an entrepreneur. If only he could have that machine. Now, the machine is not like 20,000 euros. It's just a few thousand euros. And I have a good job, and I'm thinking, oh, the poor guy, you know, he's trapped in Algeria, and probably he cannot get money from a bank because he's a student. And mind you, I've helped other friends out financially, and it's never been a problem. I always got the money back. So I'm sort of used to that, and I'm thinking, ah, oh, well, you know, 
I should help him out. And I say, okay, I can help you out with a little loan and you just give it back to me once you've established your little business. Yeah, that would be great. So in August, we meet up again. And this time we're together for like 10 days. Again, I've booked the Airbnbs. It's all very sweet by the beach and great time. And um, well, this time it wasn't all a great time because I've, I, I think now I know that the personality disorder that he has, he can cover it up for a few days, but a week and a half is definitely too long for him. <laughs> so, so all the, he was playing all the tricks from the narc book, like triangulation. He always tried to push my buttons. Like we would walk down the street and two girls approach us and he's, he goes like, Oh, hi, how are you? You know, a very slimy kind of way. And the girls are like, what is this? And he looks at me and he says, are you jealous there? Are you jealous? And I look at him and say, no, I just think you're ridiculous. <laughs> so as you can tell from this story, for example, it's not so easy to push my buttons because I've long trained myself not to react. I first observe. And once I feel that I understand the situation fully, then I react. So there was another one where um, I bought a, um, a beach ball set with um, two rackets and a ball. And he was like, oh, I've never played this before. I've never played this before. Uh, no problem. I can play this quite well. No worries. So we start playing. Within five minutes, he breaks his racket. So he has this Tunisian guy sitting just a few meters away and he's signaling, I have two records. If you want to, we can play it together. I say, that's a great offer. Let's do that. So the NARC makes sure that he plays the ball to me and each and every time, and I play it to this Tunisian guy and each and every time he plays it to me, I have to pick it up. Because it's impossible to catch it. And all the time he's saying, oh, I'm playing this for the first time. I'm playing that. Oh, I'm, I'm trying, but I can't do it. I'm okay. I say, okay. So after a while, I get tired. I'm saying, why don't we just swap? Like the Tunisian guy plays the ball to me. I play the ball to you and you play it on to him. And the other guy says, hey, no worries. Let's do that. We do that. Two minutes later, we're back in the same position. The Narcus, he just swapped places again. And I, I'm thinking like, no, I'm tired of this. This is no fun. So I say, look, I'm going for a swim. You all can play if you want to. I'm going to get us a pizza afterwards. And all of a sudden, the two of them start playing. And he's playing like uh, Vidal on the tennis court. <laughs> all of a sudden, he catches every ball. You know? And he says, oh, look at me. Look at me. I'm doing great. I'm doing great. I'm doing this for the first time, but I'm doing great. <laughs> I'm thinking, like, what the hell is going on here? Um, well, obviously, well, we, can, we all understand. Once you know what an arc is about, then you understand the story. <clears throat> yeah, so I gave him that money and I said, look, it would be really nice if I could get it back. It's also a lot of money for me, but um, I'm happy to lend it to you so you can establish yourself. Yeah, no problem. I give it back to you. Of course, I was too blue eyed to ask him for a written statement or anything. I didn't have any proof that I gave him that money. Okay. I, he, he did have some other very weird behavior patterns. Like the last day, all of a sudden, he started washing all his stuff by hand. I was like, we have a laundromat. Why don't you use that? <laughs> no, this is my obsessive side. I don't even want you to see this. And I was like, can we not just go to the beach? <laughs> no, I have to finish this. I have to do this. And again, in retrospect, I'm thinking there must be a feeling with what he was doing, lining up women one after the other, as we're going to find out later, um, that did make him maybe feel dirty, that he felt this was he needed to somewhat cleanse himself by washing all his clothes by hand or so. It was very weird. So I have to say that when I got back, I was not really honest with myself. I should have said to myself, this was not what I wanted in many ways. This didn't look good in many ways, but I didn't. I still felt, okay, this is, this is what I want to do. 
We had a lot less contact after that because he kept telling me that the internet was not working and he couldn't talk to me. So I was basically hanging on to memories and yeah, looking forward to the next time we would meet, which was again scheduled for February the year after. So, and here comes the big break. Here is where the third part of my story starts. <clears throat> on January 9th, um, I'm at the gym and I just had, uh, I just spent some time at the sauna. I'm really relaxed. I'm going into the quiet room and I'm checking my phone. And here is this message from a person whose name I know very well, but that I'm not friends with. And her name is Celine. And I have read her name on his timeline before. And I have paid attention to her before. And for everyone who's listening to try and remember names here, we're going to call her until you remember Celine Dion. Um, so you can remember, you'll hear more names like this throughout because there's a, many more names you're going to hear. So um, <laughs> you're, you're yeah. I'm very, I'm very happy we came up with the system. I hope it will help the listeners. Yeah. So she writes me and it's not, you know, it's not a direct message on Messenger, but it's one of these, you're not connected with this person, but they want to send you a message. And she says, um, are you so-and-so's girlfriend? And I say, I write back and I say, yes, why do you want to know? And she says, because so am I, and I've found five others. <laughs> and the second I read her name and I saw her message, I knew that all the suspicions I had that I had not taken seriously because of his pseudo explanations, because I didn't want to face the truth, et cetera, et cetera, that all of them were true. Uh, all I asked her, you might ask, you know, why is it some woman writes you a message? She could be a lunatic for all you know, and it could be all made up. And the only thing I asked her, I said, do you have a photograph? Because the guy actually, I don't know why, but he actually likes taking photos with the women he's with, which I find totally bizarre because he should be covering his tracks. Instead, he's taking photos. So <clears throat> she sent me that photo and I knew it all. I absolutely knew that everything was true. And we started talking and she told me that she actually had all the paperwork ready to get married to him in spring. They had been uh, involved for more than a year. He is an artist from Paris. He's um, very progressive, very liberal in her views, um, very sort of avant-garde in her art, quite um, uh, an artist I would take very seriously, also the way she has been going through the story with her art. Um, and she's also very impulsive. And at some point, and she was, you know, she's, she felt she saw something that she needed to look into. And what she saw was that a woman had a profile photograph on Facebook that was half herself and the other half was the narc. And it was put together as one person. And when she saw that, she was like, that's not a normal thing just for a friend to do. So let me ask this woman. She wrote her message, same as she did with me. And the woman, I think she called her also because they're both French speaking. And the woman said, she totally flew off the handle um, and screamed at her and um, didn't believe her or whatever. She, it must have been a very crazy conversation. So that's when Celine started writing other women as well to find out if there were more people involved with this guy. She called this woman again the next day. It's actually also a photographer from Tahiti, a former beauty uh, queen from Tahiti. It's amazing. Um, and her sister answered. And her sister said, how dare you call again? My sister um, received your call yesterday and now she's in hospital because she tried to commit suicide over your message. And um, that shows the severity of such behavior, I find. 
And so Celine called me and we we found out about another woman, um, Giselle. Who we will call Giselle, I don't know how to say Giselle's last name properly, Boonchen. Mm -hmm. So that's how you remember Giselle. Yes. And Giselle is also a photographer, a very, very successful photographer, who got involved with him because he answered one, he, he commented on a post that was actually about her brother, who are band members and also rather successful musicians. And he commented on a post about her brothers and she was like, oh, that sounds cute. And let me answer this. But she was more answering like on behalf of her brothers because it's not at all her personality to get in touch and open up to somebody online. Um, he had a way of mirroring her, of making her feel comfortable. It ended up in a way, you see, when he was, when that happened, she was going through a very bad phase. She was going through a kind of a depression because she had lost her mother. And she had been very, very close to her mother. And she was devastated about this loss. And here comes this guy, and he's all kind and mirroring her. Eventually, she believed, that is, he made her believe, that her mother sent him as a kind of a saving angel for her to overcome the death of her mother. It's that crazy. It's a crazy making can go a long way. So again, this woman also had the papers ready to marry this guy in spring. Um, now, when I learned this, all the other women, women who who learned about it, they blew up in the narc's face. How could you do this to me? This is horrible. What kind of person are you? Blah, blah, blah. Again, you don't push my buttons easily. I, I usually keep calm and want, figure out what I want to do. And I said to myself, no, what am I going to do with this trip? I'm supposed to meet this guy like five weeks from now. What am I going to do? We were supposed to meet in Morocco. Now, I was thinking, should I just arrive but not meet him and just go on the trip all by myself which I would be totally comfortable with but I was thinking I would always look over my shoulder um is he there and what is he going to do to me and I, I I felt that I wouldn't be able to enjoy this um trip so I didn't do that then I was thinking could I maybe bring in the Moroccan police and have him arrested so I asked a woman whom I'd met before. She'd lived in uh, Morocco for many, many years and had a family there. And I said, do you see any kind of way I could pull this off? And she was like, no, forget it. You don't speak the language. You're a European woman. <coughs> and um, if he as, is as persuasive as you portray him to be, then you might end up in jail rather than him. So better not try it. So I have to drink something. And um, so I came up, my son even offered, you see, my son is like two meters tall. He's a very strong guy. And he was like, mom, I'm going to just come with you and beat him up, you know. <laughs> so we're done with the story, <laughs> which I thought was absolutely fantastic to see my son support me that way. But, of course, I didn't want that at all. I didn't want to get my son involved in this. But it, it gave me a lot of strength to, to, to realize that he was fully supportive of me. So what I ended up with was um, I just kept writing love messages every day. Oh, I can't wait to see you in Morocco. I'm so happy we're going to finally get to see each other again, as if nothing ever happened. Of course he was suspicious because all the other women are causing chaos in his life. But this one woman is, is acting as if nothing happened. How is that possible? Um, how come they didn't contact her? In that case, me. Um, and I left it all until that very day when I was when we were supposed to meet in Morocco. And my last message to him was, 
I am at the airport. I'm waiting for my suitcase. Oh my God, why is this taking so long? I can't wait to see you. I love you so much. You don't know how much I love you, but I will make you feel it. <laughs> so <laughs> you want to play with words? We can play with words. So when he actually called me to say, well, where are you? I'm waiting for you. All my phones were ringing and I was on the phone. I was on, on the internet uh, connected with all the other women and we all had a glass of champagne and say, ah, now we know where he is and he's not having a good time. <laughs> so that was the first time he understood that I was out to hurt him in a way or to get him. Um, it's really difficult to describe what happened to me when I found out who he actually was. Um, on the one hand, I it, it, it shook me deeply to, I, I had to, it took me a long time to understand that the person that I thought was a kind, you know, loving, a caring, artistic, wonderful person, um, that I was in an exclusive relationship with, that he was actually a serial predator. And also, at the time, I didn't know about narcissism. There was another woman that he had been involved with um, two years prior. Her name was Drew. Who we will call Drew Barrymore. <laughs> yes. And Drew... Um, we found Drew. Also, I think Celine found Drew because she kept writing to each and everybody on, on his timeline. Um, she found her. And I'm, I'm for quite a while, I was very good friends with her. And she was the first one who explained the concept of narcissism to me. And uh, you see, my perception when I first heard who he was, was, okay, I am the loser. I am the victim. I am the idiot who fell for this. And he is the winner. He is in Algeria with this big grin on his face. I got her money. She's so stupid. And that's, of course, what he was trying to make me feel. But once you understand narcissistic abuse, and you, like in my case, how I was primed to, to be the victim of narcissistic abuse, it's all very different. Um, it, and I started to rewrite the story. I actually opened a uh, book for emo uh, a Facebook group uh, for emotional healing. And I rewrote the story. And it went something like this. Hey, ladies, um, there is good news for you. There is still a vacancy on the NARC schedule for this summer. <laughs> you know, you can book in, uh, what's in it for you. You're going to be taken this to the very same places that he has taken all the other women to, the same restaurants, the same sightseeing. You can get the same fantasies and everything. And um, you only have to pay for the travel expenses, for the hotel, and for basically everything, you know. Um, and also I, I wrote about the difference between the person he was portraying himself to be like this well-read uh, musical artist person, because I found out that all of the, none of this was true. He had been found out before, for example, by Drew, but also by a, um, a woman from uh, Finland. And they t told me a lot of uh, like about the false pictures he was posting that supposedly showed him performing on stage. And those photos were great. They looked professional. And it was a bit weird because his hair was different. He said, oh, I was so much younger. You know, I was wearing my hair differently. Well, it turns out that's actually a Japanese guitarist with the very odd and awkward habit of having his hair all over his face when he's performing. <laughs> so he could just um, um, claim it was him when really it wasn't. Um, and I think, you know, when it comes to um, this guy, we are talking about someone who will go to great lengths 
to just establish any type of relationship and, you know, the type of supply that he needed from you, he got some obviously attention, but he also got money. But in some cases, he just wanted supply. And, you know, when we talk about the deception of which she'll go and the lengths of which she'll go, you know, there's one person that was involved uh, in his life and someone who you never got to meet, who I guess we can call, um, who's I, I, in a way patient zero or or, or a person zero, the, 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 or the, where you call them, like they're the first one and or that you at least the one the first one you know of and uh that woman um had cancer and uh can you kind of explain the lengths of uh just how like out there or how con like how big of a con he can play with someone who is terminally ill yes um i i went far far back in his history. I don't think anybody knows as much about this guy as I do because I've I've done so much research. So what happened was he created a profile that he called Connie. Well, let's call her Connie. And supposedly it was this young, beautiful woman who was traveling Algeria um, with her parents, her mother and her boyfriend, actually, the mother's boyfriend. And while they were in Algeria, this young lady, Connie, she fell ill and they found out that she had brain cancer and she was terminally ill and terminally ill and she wouldn't be able to leave the hospital in Algeria again. She would die there. Now, with this character, Connie, a profile actually run by the NARC, he entered a group for cancer uh, patients and he contacted a woman, we call her Hannah who had actually had breast cancer and had just undergone an operation. And Connie and Hannah became friends. Oh, it's so good to have someone who knows what I'm going through. And it's so sad. I mean, I'm all alone here in Algeria. The only person who's taken care of me is so-and-so. That is the narc. That is himself saying that he is her best friend. Um, and he's so nice with me. And as the two women are getting closer and closer, she says, and I really have to introduce you to him. You know, he's such a wonderful person. So here he is now feeding this woman with information with two profiles. He's running the Connie Cancer profile and he's running his own profile. And for half a year, he told Hannah, Oh, you see, today is a very, very good day. I made Connie her favorite cake and we celebrated together that she's still alive. I was at the hospital and we were so happy today. It was great. The next day, oh, I, I cried all day long because they put her on new medication and it's not working and she was not well and this and that and the other. So it was a very, very colorful thing he was painting for half a year. He kept this up for half a year. And while this was going on, and because it's narc and crazy making, the Connie Cancer profile says to Hannah, oh, well, you know, I have to die anyway, but you are such a wonderful woman. You know, I would feel so much more at ease knowing that I have to die, but you are going to marry him. Then I know he will be with a good person. And you can actually still find the post where about the narc and Hannah getting married mind you she's a she's a country fellow woman of mine so she's also she has never met him as far as i know i uh, talked to friends of hers and what happened was that at some point like half a year after they started out he throws a big pity party and says oh connie died in my arms last night and um, so it's just the two of them left. Connie Cancer is out of the picture. And um, they are planning on getting married. You know, he's giving her the same story about how he's this poor guy who's in Algeria. And he would be a fantastic artist if only he could get out of Algeria. And um, what happens is at some point, this woman realizes something is wrong. And she contacts a guy who 
is a journalist himself and also a musician. And she writes to him and she says, look, I am this girlfriend of, of so-and-so, but I have a feeling something is wrong. I would like to talk to you. Now, the backstory of this journalist guy and the narc is that the narc contacted this guy about his music and then he stole all sorts of parts of his identity. Like this journalist wrote an intro about himself, which is very sensitive and very beautifully written. The guy took it, the narc took it and went in several Facebook groups with it and presented it as his own. So people immediately felt, oh, this guy is so sensitive and such so great with words. <laughs> so um, he also claimed for a very long time in his Facebook profile, the narc claimed to have founded this journalist band with him. Mind you, the journalist has never seen the guy. And I talked to him, I've met the journalist, and he said, you know what? This guy kept contacting me and I felt he was rather annoying. So every now and then I would answer him just to be not to be so impolite. But most of the time I would just ignore him, hoping he would just forget about me. And he was totally surprised when he heard that he had stolen all these things, all this information about him and presented it as his own. And also he did not really reply to Hannah when she reached out to him. But nevertheless, Hannah did lots and lots of research. She found out about the pictures that were not really his and she found out about the fake profile um she tried to do something against him uh, she tried to get him off facebook she I, I know that she actually reported him once and got him off for two days or so of course he would tell all the other women that was a crazy ex who was uh, who couldn't get over me and now she's trying to ruin my Facebook profile or something. But um, the woman had a relapse. After she found all this out, her friend described to me that she couldn't eat anymore, she couldn't sleep anymore. And on top of everything, he kept calling her and um, he didn't give her any peace. So eventually she died from the relapse. She died from cancer. And at first, when I learned about him, I really wanted revenge. I, in my head, all the, a lot of times I was screaming, die, motherfucker, die. You know, I was so upset. But as I moved on, I felt more like I wanted him to stop doing what he was doing because it is so detrimental. We already, we talked about the suicide of this lady the suicide attempt. Now this person who actually died over the story. And I felt that there was something like a mission in it for me to stop him from further damaging other people, other women. So my plan was um, to report him in Tunisia because everything that he'd done happened in Tunisia. Um, and it wasn't easy. Like I already said, you know, what the woman from Morocco said to me, you don't have a chance. So I said, I can do this if I have a man that comes with me who is familiar with the mentality there, who speaks the language and who is 100 percent loyal to me and my cause. Then I can pull this off. And I'm have, I happen to have a friend from Tunisia and he said, you know what? My father is a very influential businessman and he can help you. And this friend of mine then had to go to a hospital and his father came to our city and I had a chance to meet him in person. And I thought, wow, that's great. And he actually started out by saying, yeah, sure, I will help you. And it's no problem because I, I, I do business um, with Al Algerian companies a lot. It's no problem for me. I can arrange it. Okay, great. But uh, over time, it turned out that he felt there was some sort of package deal <laughs> that included me and certain favors uh, as he was doing me a favor. And I said, no, I'm sorry, that's not included. You either help me or you don't <laughs> because I'm a friend of your, your, um, your son or you just don't help me. You know, I will find my way because what was really important for me 
Whatever I did, I talked to so many people, but I always told them, look, I'm contacting you because you are dealing with someone who is not giving you the full picture. So I want to give you the information that you are not getting, but I feel you are entitled to, to understand what you're heading into. Because it is very difficult to get someone off the internet or off Facebook. I tried it. I had 30 people sign a letter to testify that my story, I wrote the whole story for them, whatever he was doing there, to Facebook, and they all signed it and said, we are witness that this is a true story. But Facebook didn't even answer me. Um, what I had done in the meantime, though, is I had drawn up false profiles to warn of him because I had understood he was feeling secure. He was all the way back in Algeria. Nobody can go there. You know, nobody can contact him there. And he was like, I could do whatever I want. And I, I was thinking about, I said, you know what? I cannot get to you. But on the other hand, you cannot get to me. I can do a whole lot of things and you can't do anything about it. And I drew up these false profiles for one that warned of him. And um, he found out about that. And obviously it was getting under his skin because one night I get um, a message from a profile called Savannah Stanfield. <laughs> We don't need a fake name for it because obviously it's fake. It's Savannah Stanfield. And Savannah Stanfield says, oh, my God, I'm so glad you wrote this warning message on Facebook um, because I used to know this guy. I actually helped him a lot uh, when he was at, uh, at the university. You see, the problem that the NARC was having now. Savannah Stanfield was supposed to convince me that he that she was a woman that had been taken advantage of sort of by him. On the other hand, we all know that a narcissist is by no means able to say anything negative about himself. So you juggle this is not an easy one. He tried, but I was immediately I was like, oh, my God, this is hilarious. So he said, <clears throat> Yeah, back then he had some problems in his studies, but that wasn't his fault. It was all because of the teachers, you know, they didn't his <laughs> And um, you see, and also I, I, I was very good friends with him. I helped him, but of course I was not stupid enough to give him money. Again, he was trying to push my buttons, but I was just laughing it off. And then uh, she said, but you see, it's like this. <clears throat> I have gone to a therapy. I have had a therapy for two years now. And I am much better than ever. You see, actually, I've learned so much from this experience. And not only am I really on top of the world now, I'm so happy. I have found the man of my dreams. And next week, I'm getting married. <laughs> It's so funny because this is how you detect a narcissist. They can never have a small story. The story, they cannot stop until they've blown it completely out of proportion. So she said to me, you know, I wish you could feel the same peace. Uh, so don't be negative about the experience you've lived. We can call it an initiative experience. I think really time to let go. So I was laughing like I can't tell you. And I wrote back, Savannah, it is so good to hear from you. And your story is amazing. You've healed and I'm so happy for you. And look at yourself. You're getting married next week. That's fantastic. The only thing I don't understand is why, if you're getting married next week, five days before your marriage, in the middle of the night, you're Googling this guy's names, you f name, you find my Facebook page and you write me this long post. I really don't get it. You know, what is going on? <laughs> so, so he had a lot of problems explaining this now. And Savannah wrote back. She said, yeah, I know I shouldn't be doing this in a way, but I am so curious, you know, how many women have you found already? How many women have contacted you? And, you know, what is their story? 
And um, also, you know, I just want to know, is he really the person I think he is? Blah, blah, blah. So I, I, I wrote back, Savannah, you know, I understand you in a way, but you know what? Uh, don't be negative about the experience you've lived. <laughs> you found someone new. You moved on. It's really time to let go now. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> and while I was typing this, I swear, tears were running down my cheeks. I couldn't stop laughing. And unfortunately, I didn't copy paste the conversation because immediately after I sent this off, a few minutes later, Savannah Stanfield uh, miraculously disappeared and was never seen again. Her pro <laughs> disappeared um, and that was it. So, um, yeah, I threw that back at him. But another thing I had done also is I had gone to the police right away. After I found out, another friend supported me. He had contacts with the police. He said, look, this guy is a criminal and you have to report him. And it helped me so much because my the whole plan was to create something like a paper trail or some sort of evidence, you know, for other people to see. Because I, I, I was, I, I had a feeling that I didn't have enough evidence to actually get him convicted for anything. But I do, I did want to make sure that his betrayal and what he was doing would become a reality and would leave actual traces. So I went to the police and at first there was a guy and he took down the story, like the broad frame of it. And he said, it's really good that you came because this happens a lot and you're just you're a victim, you know, it's not your fault. The policeman told me this and he said, it's good that you reported. So we actually have an idea how much of this is actually going on. For the actual um, report, though, you have to go and see someone else. Um, you will, we will send you an invite. So we went there and here is this policewoman. <clears throat> and she makes me feel like Oh well, you know, I I would have better things to do, but as you are here, let me put, let me take this down. And I was like, uh, and and at some point she said to me, "Oh, we have child trafficking stuff, and you know, we you want me to put this down?" And I said, "No, wait a minute. This is my country. Something I have been done wrong, and I want to report this. Are you telling me I can't do this?" And no, no, you can do this, but there's nothing we can do about it anyway. I said, well, I'm going to do something with this. I'm going to send the report to the embassy, to the German embassy in Algeria and to the German embassy in Tunisia and whatever else country, because it's just an email for me. And I'm going to tell them that if this guy wants a visa to come to Europe, please don't give it to him. And here is the evidence. And that's when she looked at me. She's like, oh, that's a smart idea. <laughs> You should give me that idea. And uh, on a side note, I did send that to the embassy and they were very interested. And they said, yes, please send us all the evidence and we will put it in our files. And should he ever show up here, then we know what to do with it. And mind you, I never contacted this guy again, except for when I actually had something in hand. And with this, I forwarded the email of the German embassy to him and I said, good news, you know what? The German embassy is really interested in you. <laughs> I said, um, you know, if you, um, probably if you go and apply for a visa there, your chances might be slim, but if you keep going as you are and you keep, you keep the money and don't spend it as you're cheating people out of it, you might be able to buy yourself false papers in, let's say, five years from, five years from here. And then who knows what happens, you know, <laughs> or maybe you just stay where you are. <laughs> I couldn't, I couldn't help that. I didn't contact him much, but I needed that. <clears throat> Yeah, and about the police report, I also, I asked Celine and Giselle to please, please, please report him. Now, Celine is a person, she's not at all into state-operated stuff, and the police are like, really, she didn't want to have anything to do with the police. And I understand her. And also, I feel that France, in France, the role of women is... Um, not the best in this situation. Uh, French 
people would usually blame the woman. There is not much awareness of serial predators as such. But at some point, you know, there was this thing going on. She was still in contact with him because he had kept her computer and so on and so forth. And um, she was still sort of fascinated with his personality, I think. And um, at some point she got scared because he threatened her. He said, if I see you again, I'm going to kill you. And she said, no, I really want to make sure that he cannot come to France. And I said, well, if you, the best, your best bet then is to report him to the police. So you have something written, a written statement. And she said, I'm not going to the police. I don't know how to do this. And here comes this other woman. Her name is Bridget. And for the purpose of our show, we're going to call Bridget, Bridget Bardot. Right. And she lives a very different lifestyle. Her husband is a lawyer. She's involved in the story. I will refer to that later. And she has friends at the police station. And it's no problem for her at all to go there and report somebody. So I say to Celine, why don't you take somebody? But at the time, I'm not thinking about Bridget. But as soon as Bridget hears that, she says, I can help you with that. I know people at the police station. No worries. I even know whom to talk to. So what happens is that these two very, very different women meet up at the police station. They go inside together and they're not like as they enter, they're very aware of their differences. They're not really fans of each other or anything. So they go into the police station. Bridget handles the whole thing. Okay, we have an appointment. This is what we're here for. And the policeman says to them, oh, you have to sit down and wait a little bit and we'll call you in. So these two women are sitting there waiting together and magic happens. All of a sudden, they start talking to each other and they start sharing on a level that usually they wouldn't get into. Like, oh, you have children. I have a son, too. And they show each other photographs and they talk about their lives and they talk about how they got involved in all of this. And once they call the two women in for the interview, something has changed. I wouldn't say they have become friends as such, but... The situation is very, very different from one hour ago. They really have a deeper understanding and a lot of sympathy for each other. And this is why, for me, the whole story is also really a story about solidarity amongst each other and how we can beat evil and see the good in people and how this can actually bring out the good in people and how we can help each other along. And this is also part of what your podcast is about, about sharing and helping each other understand. So back to Bridget's story. And her story was that she had been, you know, flirting with him online. She's actually happily married, but it, you know, over the years, something was lacking, some sort of adventure or excitement or so. And she got into this little online thing, but she'd never met him. And she also felt that he was quite weird at times. Um, but there was some flirty stuff going on that at first she would have not wanted her husband to see. So when she found out what was actually going on with all the other women she volunteered to be a double agent. For example, when she heard about the Morocco story, she was all in the picture. And when he came back from Morocco, he wrote me an email saying he had the best of times. He was um, drinking the best wines and smoking the best hashish, which is something I neither drink alcohol nor do I smoke weed. So I that totally didn't intrigue me. And he had sex with three different women from three different continents with three different hair colors. You figure out what that means with the hair colors and all. I I don't know. Um, and then he, he was cussing me how it was this and that and the other. But it only made me laugh because I knew that the very first day he was by himself, he had phoned Bridget like in tears I'm here in Morocco all by myself. I don't know what to do. I'm so scared and I'm, I'm, I can't even leave the room and no, 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 no. So he was, you know, you really, I think dealing with a narcissist, you really have to understand that the surface and what they want you to believe 
is a far, far cry from what is actually going on for them. Um, the existence of a narcissist, I feel, is a, it's, it's rather to be pitied as such. And I don't mean they are not um, guilty or anything. I don't mean, you know, we should be all sorry for them. But it is so helpful to understand their mindset because they are so predictable. And this is what helped me in, in hunting him down because I could basically predict what he was going to do next. <clears throat> and still my plan was to go to Tunisia and report him there. Um, but I couldn't find anyone. I simply couldn't find anyone. And here comes another woman into the picture. We call her Nina. And to remember her, we will call it Nina Simone for people who are trying to remember all the names. <laughs> and Nina is also a musician. And he contacted her about some music story. <clears throat> and she is also in a relationship. The same um, situation as Bridget. She's also in a relationship. She's not unhappy, but something is missing, has gone missing over time. So he's making her all these compliments and he's hitting a soft spot in her. And they start exchanging these flirty texts and he starts sending her poems, <clears throat> which he claims are his own. And she's quite a, 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 a well-educated person. And at some point she says, this poem, I'm sorry, it's too good. Okay, this, I don't think he can possibly write all these poems all by himself all the time. So let me, and she, she goes and she puts a, a, a two lines into Google and turns out it is, I don't know, Heine or something or Rilke or Goethe or whatever. And she says, okay, this is definitely going too far. I've been suffering this fool for long enough. I'm going to end it here. And the narc goes, if you do that, I will send all the texts that have ever been exchanged between us to your boyfriend, and I will tell him everything. And mind you, Nina is not a person to mess with. She's very level-headed, you know, very clear usually. And she thinks about it for a little bit and she says, I'm not going to let that idiot blackmail me. And she takes the text and she goes to her boyfriend. She said, listen, I have something to talk to you about. And she explains the whole thing and she says, look, I love you, but something has gone missing. Maybe we can fix it. And it turns out that this crisis actually helped their relationship to improve again. And the same thing happened with Bridget. He also threatened her to publish the texts and, and, and give them to her husband. And I suggested to her, well, you could just give them to your husband yourself and use it as an opportunity to talk about this and what is actually missing between the two of you. And at first she was like, no, I can't do that. I can't do that. She did it and it worked out beautifully because she was always sure that her husband loved her very much. So... Also, it's very important for me to let people know honesty can win at times. Solidarity can take us a long, long way. If we look out for each other, we can, we can be better for it and we can overcome the evilness of such people. So <clears throat> Nina then says to me, look, I don't want to save anyone. You're all writing to these other women. I'm not interested in that. You know, everyone has his own fate. You came out for the better or you, you, do, you found your way. I found my way. I'm not interested in that. But if ever, if ever you see an opportunity to actually get to him, like a reality thing that would actually change something in his life, let me know I'm in. So I kept in touch with her and... Like I said, you know, I never pressured anyone. One time, for example, I contacted someone about Hannah, the woman who died. And I asked very carefully, have you ever heard anything about this story? And they said to me, no, no, we've, we visited her just before she was dying on a regular basis, but she never mentioned that to us. And I said, look, just forget I called. Just keep your memory as you have it and don't even think twice about it. 
It was very important for me not to cause any extra pain. So meanwhile, I'm still looking for this person to go to Tunisia with me. <laughs> and, and one day, um, Nina talks to, she sees a video on Facebook and she comments on it. Turns out it's a guitar teacher from Algeria and they make music together in France. And as they are speaking, she realizes, wow, this guy lives in the actual same city as the Nark. So she says, hey, do you happen to know this guy? And he goes, yeah, I know this guy. And you will not believe the story that happened to me. So he comes out. He says, well, he's a guitar teacher who actually helped build the conservatory in this city in Algeria. He's a very well-known guitar teacher in this place. And one day, the narc knocks at his door and says, oh, well, you see, I was at the conservatory, but uh, what I learned there, I know that the level is not so good. Um, and I really want to become this brilliant guitarist. And I want to go to Europe and be an artist. And I was wondering, you know, I would really love to take lessons with you. Could I not just come and take private classes? And the guitar teacher tells Nina, and you know, the guy was so convincing. I, I, the way he talked, I was so impressed. I invited him to have dinner with us. And I said, look, just come back in, a, in two or three days and I'll, we'll, we'll see what happens. Because he doesn't teach anybody. He just teaches, um, he doesn't teach just anybody. He teaches people with talent. You know, when he sees, oh, wow, this could be a real artist. He has the, the flavor of it, the gist of it. That's the person he'll teach. So the narc comes and the guitar teacher says um, he couldn't even tune to his guitar by himself. And he totally doesn't have any talent. He doesn't have an artistic spark in him, you know. And I told him, I'm really sorry, but I cannot teach you. You just don't have it. And the guy goes, ah, well, I see. No worries. But could you still write me a recommendation so I can go to Europe? <laughs> The audacity of it, amazing. And he says, no, I cannot. So the narc leaves and says, okay, well, I take that. Man. And the guitar teacher tells Nina the story, and then Nina tells him the story of all the women that this guy has been taken advantage of. Meanwhile, we had established that he had probably taken something like 25,000 euros and in some cases, that was somebody's, that came out of somebody's pension scheme, for example. So they were left without money, and he was presented with guitars and uh, a, a GoPro and that kind of stuff. And this guitar teacher is a very, very upright person. And he's infuriated by this story. And he thinks of his own two daughters, and one of them also had a bad experience. And he's saying, no, 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 I can't let this happen. Something needs to be done about this guy. And he writes on Facebook, if this guy is your friend on Facebook, please delete him because he has he's a serial predator and has been taken advantage of many women. And he's writing this just to make sure in French and in English. And he is tagging all the musicians around the place. <laughs> which is in itself, you see, Algeria is a very conservative society. You really want to keep your face. You really want to keep your reputation clean. So this is already bad for this guy, for the narc. And one of the musicians tagged in this post is one of his flying monkeys. And she writes to the guitar teacher, I saw you. I saw your post. How can you say something so mean about this guy? I've known him for such a long time and he's always been so sweet with me and all. And the guitar teacher is a little bit like, ah, well, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe this is not true. But he's saying, no, no, no. I know this from a very reliable source and I leave the post where it is. The next day, somebody knocks at the guitar teacher's door. Turns out to be the narc. 
And at first, he's trying to be this nice person. He says, oh, I, you know, how much I adore your work and, you know, your teachings. And you you put out this really mean post about me. And I am not like that. And please take this down. And the guitar teacher told me later, when I saw him there saying this, I knew that the story was true. Because otherwise, he would not have shown up like that. And he says, no. I know the story and I leave the post where it is. And when the narc flipped and he got very aggressive and he tried to kick in the door and try to beat him up. And that was when he knew this was true and he kept the post. And for me, this was the biggest relief because now, now all of a sudden you would Google, you would put the name in the narc's name in Facebook and this warning post would show up. And it was a legitimate timeline. It was a respectable person. It was a man who was not involved. I was so utterly grateful, like I can't tell you. So I got his uh, contact details and I wrote him a letter. I said, listen, I wrote him on Facebook. I, listen, I'm so grateful to you. Thank you so much. And I told him what I had been doing and trying to do against this guy. And I think because I was never pressing anyone to become involved, people actually lent themselves, you know, they they uh, offered their help. And so did he, like he gave me the details of the cyber police in Algeria. He said, maybe they can do something for you. And at some point when I didn't find anyone to go to Tunisia with me, I said, look, do you think maybe you could come with me? Because I know I can trust you. You would be the type of person that I'm looking for. And he said, no, I can't do it. But I have a very good friend, you could ask. Um, why don't you call him? And I was like, you know, I was thinking, okay, that's great. But I cannot just tell anyone who's not involved. I've never talked to that person. I don't, you know, who is this guy? I, and the guy actually contacted me and said, okay, we have a common friend. He said, I should reach, reach out to you. And um, I cut him short. I said, look, I don't have time now, but it's really nice you're reaching out to me. And uh, I get back to you some other time. I kept looking, couldn't find anyone. And then I asked the guitar teacher, who is this guy really? And he said, it's my very, very best friend. I said, okay, let me give this a try. So I started talking to this guy. I explained the whole story to him. And he said, yeah, I think I can help you. Um, I could go to Tunisia with you, but I could also go directly to Algeria with you. I am also from that very same city. And you could report him directly to the police station or to the police in that very same city. <clears throat> now, that was something I had never dreamt of. That was totally beyond the wildest imagination. But then it turned out that this guy also became interested in me as a woman. And I said to myself, okay, I've seen this before. <laughs> Remember the package deal misunderstanding? You know, we're not going to have that again, please. And uh, so one day he's in, in Paris and he says, oh, it's so romantic here. You should be here with me. And I totally blew a fuse. I went up like a nuclear bomb, you know. <laughs> I said, uh, how dare you say this to me? That's impossible. I've asked you for help. And if you think you're going to get any favors, then uh, that's not the case. And I will somehow manage without you and blah, blah, blah. Um, he called me after that. And he said, look, I apologize. I should not have said it the way I said it. But it is true. I, I feel that I'm in love with you and um, I want to make you an offer. I will take you to Algeria. I will take you to the police. I know I can help you because, which is true, he comes from a very prominent family in this city. He's very well connected and he really knows how to pull stuff off in this place. I will do all of this. I will introduce you to my family. I will also show you the beauty of Algeria because I am sorry that you you learned about Algeria the way you did. And I want to show you that not all Algerians are like this. 
I want to show you the beautiful um, landscape and I also want to introduce you to the people who are not like this. And if after that you feel that you're interested in me and maybe we could get together, then it's up to you. And if not, then it's okay with me. You know, I will totally accept that and I will be happy to have met you anyway. As I thought about it, we did meet up and uh, he's a wonderful person. And we did go to Algeria together. And um, when I came to see the city, I said to myself, okay, this is not a horrible place to be. It is not. Uh, you can have a, a, a good standard of living there. But if you are a person who wants to live like someone in Paris, London, Berlin, like techno music and wild parties and progressive thinking and, um, you know, want to try yourself out on Tinder or something, it's definitely the wrong place to be. <clears throat> Um, there's hardly any music around. Islam is running quite high. Um, if you have all these progressive ideas, it's not a good place for you. So before we went to the police, I sat down for a moment and I said, I understand that in a way he is already sort of punished because the way he's living and the way he will be living most likely um, is so far from what his dreams are that maybe that is punishment enough. But then again, <clears throat> I was thinking about Hannah and how he ruthlessly pursued her, even though she was dying, and how he uh, got her involved under this pretext of this fake profile and everything. I said, no, I want this to stop. I really want this to stop. I do not want other women to suffer the same. So we did go to the police <clears throat> and at first they were like, no, no, if this woman wants her money back, you know, that's not, we can't do this. And um, I think I want to introduce him by now, <laughs> um, Hamid, Hamid and I, Hamid is the guitar teacher's friend. Um, Hamid managed to tell them, no, she doesn't want her money back. She wants this to stop. She wants this guy out of the picture. You know, she, she wants to stop him from doing what he's doing. So we, we, then, uh, we then moved on to another young police officer, you know, like a, a picture book police officer with a leather jacket. I mean, nobody wants to go to the Algerian police, but you're surprised, you know, they, they, they have still have the same stereotype like in other places. So I tell the story and Hamid translates it for me. So it fits into the Algerian thinking patterns, which helps a lot, obviously. And as I move on with my story, I can see how the officers are getting angrier and angrier. And then turns out that one of them says, I know whom you're talking about. Because the narc had the nerve to go to the police station and report the guitar teacher about the post that he put on Facebook for, for libel. Just audacity again of it, right? And um, the guitar teacher had actually told me about it and about the interview he had had at the police station. And in the process of that interview as well, the officer got really angry because Algerians feel, if they hear a story like this, they feel that they are painted in a very bad light abroad. And they don't like that. And so what happened was I gave them my story. I signed it for the first time, maybe the last time in my life. I signed with my fingerprint. <laughs> and after that, they went off in two police cars to collect him and take him to the station. The address they had for him was obsolete. So they actually had to go. They went to his conservatory and said, we are looking for so-and-so. Can you give us his current address? Again, think about the kind of society that we are talking about. Very conservative, very much about your reputation, what kind of person you are. You have to be a good person, a decent person. They found him in his father's house. Like I portrayed, he was staying in his house with his siblings. 
they they took him to the police station. They took him out of the house in handcuffs and took him to the police station to question him. Obviously, as I had anticipated, he wasn't thrown into jail. He wasn't kept overnight even, which would have been, in my opinion, ideal. It did not have, it did not come out that way. But I had accomplished my mission because his life in Algeria was totally impossible. It had become impossible. Uh, the fact that he had been uh, taken in by the police and questioned and everything, he was like dead. Um, he has since left Algeria to try his luck um, in Tunisia, uh, working at a club for tourists. Mm -hmm. When COVID came, that obviously fell sour. Um he has been, in my opinion, probably pretending to have a relationship with a woman from Italy. Um, I talked to her and I had I was under the impression that she was a narcissist herself. And mind you, two narcs, you know, all of the best of luck. I'm happy with that. <laughs> Don't harm other people. Just, you know, uh, do it to each other. That's fine by me. Yeah. And um I have been provided with information on what he's doing, but um, I, I feel that I cannot credibly still continue doing what I was doing. It's been more than two years now. And I have a lot of people, a lot of my friends, my therapist has been, have been worried about me. Um, are you ever going to be able to let this go? You cannot spend the rest of your life doing that. And you have to really see this. It was like a second job. I would work my daytime job and immediately I, I would stand up and leave my desk and I would start working on this, on putting this, all this stuff together. Um, but I can say I can very well let this go. Um, also, what helps is you see, we have this narc and we have all these women on the other side, but we also have the guitar teacher and there's Hamid. Two men have made this possible. Two men have made it possible to take this guy out of the game, at least for a while, and to really change his life. I find this is very um, reconciling. You know, this is not a men women antagonistic pattern. It's not. This is very much for me a story about solidarity. And in the process of the story of solidarity, you have found love. Absolutely. Yes. I'm I am very, very happy, Hamid and I. We have a long distance relationship. Um, but right now I am I'm staying with him and um it's wonderful. He's he's not, you know, he's nothing like all the men I ever had before, um, because I now understand narcissistic abuse. I now understand what I was attracted to, because that was what I grew up with. That was my normal. Being abused by a narcissist was what I thought was a normal pattern. And having understood that, and also you know, now to me, narcissistic abuse or toxic people in general, they they cause a certain physical sensation in me. I don't know if that makes sense, but um, I really have sensors for people like this now. And I, I you know, they're, I don't think twice. I have set myself a motto as a, I started with it last year, and it says, no toxic people in my life. And I cut them out. As I see them, I say, okay, thank you. <laughs> Got the T-shirt. I'm not interested. And my life has changed immensely. I found love. I found peace. Mind you, I would not say this is, um, I have arrived somewhere and I'm safe and I never have to think about it again. I read a lot about narcissistic abuse. I um, I find there is great material on the internet about narcissistic abuse that I listen to on a regular basis just to remind myself. 
but it's not um, a threat anymore. It is something I can control. It's something I understand. I know how to put an end to it. Well, Nico, before we end off the show, do you have any last words of advice or wisdom for people who have gone through uh, this type of abuse? Yeah, I, I, I hope I can find, say a few things that also I've been, uh, you know, pushing in, in my emotional uh, healing group, for example. One is be really honest with yourself and trust your gut. Because usually all the information you need is already there. When you look back, um, you would say like, that person made me feel weird. You know, or that person that seemed odd at the time because of my narcissistic abuse as a child, I learned to um, uh, forget about un things that made me uneasy within seconds, <laughs> which makes me a very cheerful and happy person. <laughs> but basing my decisions on only the positive side of things is, of course, a disaster, a recipe for disaster. Um, what I did, for example, is for a few days, I actually um, noted down like every half an hour things that made me feel uneasy or things that made me feel uncomfortable, just so I wouldn't dismiss them immediately. And it helped me to understand that these are um, vital signs that we give ourselves, you know, and that we need to pay attention to. So be honest with yourself, listen to your gut, educate yourself on narcissistic abuse, and just continue doing that. You know, just see it, don't see it as a disadvantage that this is a part of life, but see it as something that is just a, a good part of you. And you, a good self-care means that you don't want to abandon the subject, but you just keep it as, as a good friend. I find that all this material about all this knowledge, all this material, they're good friends, you know? And I listen to it and say, that's true. Oh, how clever is that? <laughs> For example. And this is also how I listen to your show. You know, all the insights that people have had and say, wow, look at that. Because narcissist, narcissism, I always said, I want to in, invent this machine because narcissists, they actually use the same word. You know, they are totally not creative. They are 100, almost 100% 100 predictable. And it, it also has something comical about it in a way. And uh, if you understand that, if you're really well-educated on narcissism, I feel you're much, much safer, you know. And then also, like what I said, eliminate toxic people of you, out of your life. Don't hold on because they are occupying space valuable space in your life you only have that much space in your life if you give that to a toxic person it also means this space is not available for someone who would actually do something good for you be aware that your resources which make up your life time and space you know are, are uh, not uh, infinite you know, make them valuable, make them matter and give them to the right people. And that is also the last thing maybe I want to say. Find your network, find your tribe, find the people you can really trust and run your stories by them and promise yourself that you're going to listen to them. And that does not mean that you're going to do everything the way people tell you. But it means, for example, had I been really open about this story and about what actually happened with the narc, I'm sure my best friend would have said, well, you know what? I see a red flag, you know, or I smell a rat. Or she would have, you know, poked some holes into his story because she wasn't trauma bonded. And that is super valuable. Find these people for yourself. Like today, I message with something like five or six people, or maybe even more, almost on a daily basis. They are distributed all over the globe. You know, we, we, uh, we connect via WhatsApp voice messages. We, we send each other messages, sometimes 20 minutes long, 
And it's a great way of connecting because it's the next best thing to a conversation. But I can listen to it whenever I have time. I can listen to it again. And it's very, very valuable. And I feel that every time someone says, I've lost my the joy in my life. I lost my happiness because uh, I was abused by a narcissist. That makes me very, very sad. And I, I do feel we can rewrite the story. We do not have to see ourselves as victims. We were attacked by serial predators who moved in with a plan. And we were sort of naive, maybe. And we were primed for abuse. But really, we are the, the ones with all the values. You see, I started to see myself as um, a casket full of gold, gold pieces and jewelry. <laughs> you know, as something really valuable. And if now when somebody comes my way, I'm like, are you really, should you be entitled to actually touch the gold pieces in my in my casket, you know, should you actually are you in my in my box? Is that really are, do you qualify? That's how we should look at ourselves. I feel, and then that goes back to your question about self esteem, and uh, that can be self care and self esteem. Work on that, and you can be safe again. I am very very much in love. I'm very happy. I'm being treated very well. We are having a wonderful relationship. Um, and it's possible. I find a lot of people feel that it's not possible. But yes, it is possible. Believe in that. Well, Nico, as I said to everyone before, you are a master storyteller. You were fantastic. You did an excellent job. You're infectious. You know, you, you did an amazing job. This is um, going to be, I think, an episode people are going to talk about for a long time, and it's going to cross over. I just want to thank you for being here and sharing your story with me, sharing the story of many people and getting yes. it out there. And, you know, you did really, you know, you know, maybe this is the last point for you right here. And, you know, as far as, you know, this journey that, that you've been on w with this specific uh, person and you know you telling it I mean just you did amazing and I can't thank you enough thank for, you. for being here with me today thank you so much for giving me that chance well you're welcome and for Nico and myself uh, to everyone else who is out there who's still listening I hope you have a good night